start off with, I think, what everybody suggested we should talk about, but I'm happy to adapt. This is very informal. Um, I will note a couple things. How many people use our studio? All right, so a couple. Um, so our studio, what I want to address is various forms of interactivity. So generally, um, I've become very spoiled. When I see a graphic, I want to push on it. I want it to move. I want it to zoom. Uh, for various reasons, I mean, we all have these that we have that interaction. But also on the New York Times, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, ESPN, uh, the one that hadn't done a very good job yet is Sports Illustrated, 538, uh, Upshot, all these people are starting to move static to interactive. Um, because of a couple reasons. One is, um, and I'm going to suggest a whole set of talks that we just recorded um, in Toronto uh, last week. Um, at the end of the thing, but, um, the lady, and I can't remember her name, but I'll figure it out. But I know most of you have some biostats or some sort of derivative of that um, experience or concentrated in that field. She, she was the developer of PhiloSync, if anybody uses that. If not, it's really cool. So there's three layers of interaction for graphics. One is you exploring data. The other is you collaborating with people in your field that understand the data, but also want to be able to explore it. And then the third is publishing to a general audience or even a scientific audience for various reasons, whether it's a journal publication, whether it's a presentation. Um, for any of those reasons, uh, interactivity is very, very powerful, I think. The, the way I know how to do it, um, is through R, but I will say that the more I look at this stuff, the more that first statement becomes more obvious to me. Um, I'm not the first one with this idea, um, nor will I do it last. And interaction techniques for R go back to all sorts of, um, let's see, does that work? Yeah, um, all sorts of uh, separate programs, separate um, things, TCLTK, uh, where they had some really, really interesting um, work and to how do you make these ggplot based graphics, any of these things that we spit out, how do we make them so we can play with them? Um, so pull a promise littered with failure. I think that finally we're going to move more toward the promise side than the failure side, and that everybody has a web browser, so we don't have to install something new. Um, and JavaScript, with all of the Googles and Microsofts and uh, Mozilla's and various others, have made client-side JavaScript really fast. Um, if y'all haven't seen them in script, then it'll take C code, port it to a subset of very quick um, ASM uh, JS, and it's it's screaming fast. It's funny that now, uh, most of the time, my JavaScript, if I run a similar method, is faster than my R. You know, R is not fast. It's not a hard benchmark to beat. Uh, but it is pretty impressive that you can roll through massive, massive sets of data. Uh, I do want to comment that everything on this was produced from R. The slideshow is R. It's out on GitHub. It's published, so you can pull it up on your phone. I had my iPad, I forgot to pull it up, but it works very similarly on that, so you can touch and drag. All of this was done from R. This is a web page. Uh, I guess I need to prove it. Um, but you'll notice inspect element. And this is using reveal.js, the JavaScript presentation framework. Uh, I didn't show up, but I'll show you the, the underlying source code. And I'll even, if you're interested, show you how to build it from our studio. This is all a very simple little document with some code underneath it. There it is. Um, so you can see traditional HTML page with all the things that we would expect from HTML and JavaScript. So there are two ways to attack this. Is one is how do you make something that's interactive? And two ways to separate that is do you want to make a graph that works or do you want to do all the plumbing and infrastructure to help somebody make a graph? 
I want to focus on the uh, the first of those. How do you use these things that people like um, uh, Ramnath by Eden Nathan, our studio, uh, Hadley Wickham, all the people that we might know and love, how do we use those in our various fields? And fortunately, like ggplot based graphics, they're designed to be not field specific. So that that's one of the few things that we all might be able to talk about and share in terms of knowledge. Um, so is that okay or do y'all want to see how to make a widget? Um, I think we have time for both. We can try. There's a, in that set of videos, um, the, uh, one of the authors, Ron, uh, uh, talks about how to make a widget. So if we don't get to it, um, there's a really good set how to do that. He walks through the code, live codes, a widget. Uh, you, you, you see? Uh, the guy behind Knitter, who's also now at our studio, did a short talk at LA, Data Science LA, uh, that's also on YouTube about how to make a widget. Like, not how do you produce a plot, but how do you do the infrastructure and plumbing. Um, so three ways kind of to get JavaScript into R. Um, and I'll use JavaScript, but what I mean is all web, um, HTML, CSS, sort of the whole set of dependencies to make it work. V8, do you all know what V8 is? Uh, V8 is the JavaScript engine that powers Node, um, uh, various other things. Basically, it's the JavaScript runner behind most browsers. So if you separate it out, the part that runs the JavaScript, that's V8. Um, Zerone Ooms with OpenCPU, he's actually a student at UCLA, um, uh, made this package V8. So we can run JavaScript code, we can run Node programs straight from R. Pretty neat. Um, not really applicable to this topic, but I thought I'd show it just because it's fun. Manually, um, with HTML tool, just straight manual, you can write a text file and include it into code. Um, HTML tools is a set of tools that will help you just generate HTML tags, um, escape the characters and text, and all those just pain in the ass things that you will eventually run into if you do this a lot. And R Markdown, or any Markdown really, um, is where, does everybody know what Markdown is? It's just a, a pretty form of HTML. So instead of open tag stuff, Close tag and all these nested elements. You can just do it for a header. You do a pound sign. Um, all that's built in, but it's really, really hard when you want to produce things for all these different contexts. And when I say context, one is all these things. I'm going to use our studio, but they work just as well in traditional R GUI. Um, it'll just open your browser rather than the little viewer window within our studio. Um, and then the last one is HTML widgets is a joint effort um, to sort of solve a lot of these problems. So that if I want to do it on my screen, play with it, and then I say, well, that's pretty neat. Let me make it interactive for my colleagues at work or in my field to play with with Shiny. I can make a little app with it. Or at the end of the stage, what if I just want to share it with the world, put it up on our pubs or uh, does everybody know about our pubs? Um, it's sort of a click button sharing. So if you take an R Markdown file, it'll have a button on top of R Studio and you say publish. And I believe you can do it anonymously and it's there for all the world to see, code, and final output. In all these contexts, HTML widgets work perfectly. The only one, uh, and I y'all can guess if you'd like, um, that it won't work on is PDF. <laughs> SVG will work in PDF, but it's hard to get interactive graphics in a static, static mechanism. So there are efforts to take screenshots uh, with PhantomJS or something like that where we'll take it and do a static image like in a scientific publication um, just so you can kind of see or express what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so I'm going to focus on V8 for real quick. This is the others, um, how to get R to JavaScript and JavaScript back to R. So HTML widgets right now in the current format are more R to JavaScript, but not back. Um, but we're working on it, uh, incorporating that into uh, 
uh, for Shiny and making it both input and output. Right now it's output. So if you, you know, have a scatter plot, you select these 10, highlight them, R has no way to know that those 10 might be something you want to run additional statistical analysis on. But that's my ultimate goal in all of this. And unless we accomplish that, I feel very unsuccessful. So we're in the process. V8's neat in that it's hard to show what happened without running this, but in our markdown, I just did this, right? And this is coming up as my result. So I just added one plus one. What? Well, turn the lights off. Does that help? Or? The black background probably doesn't help. Is that better? So, you know, I don't think we need JavaScript or R to tell us what one plus one, plus one is. Mm -hmm. But this is JavaScript code. If anybody's written JavaScript, you know, it's fine so long. And that's the result. So, neat. You can run V8 um, JavaScript. Uh, you can take node programs. Um, what's really neat is if you take these inscription JavaScript, uh, C projects. I don't know if um, anybody knows, but Liv Haru is a PDF render, and even SQLite. Take the C code, you can make it into JavaScript, and then you can run that in R. Mm -hmm. um, I'll kind of get back to it. I wanted to save that for later, but if anybody sees this and they want to click on, these are all links. I don't have a lot of web connection. Um, but then, so let's say that V8 is neat, but really not what he told us. What we really want to do is make a widget or get JavaScript HTML inside of our presentation or just on our, on our window. So here you see um, this is our markdown. We can run the code and document the element. And this div was blank when it started. You can tell here that it was blank, but then I just figured out ugly manual example. Well, if that's all we wanted to accomplish, we certainly don't need widgets. I mean, that's very simple. Just do that. But what happens is I think what we'll want to use is D3, JS, uh, all the various libraries built on top of D3, plot charts, leaflet, um, crosslet mapping engine, um, all of these other things. And what comes with that is generally a whole set of JavaScript and CSS dependencies that we need to inject into our page, which is easy, potentially, unless you have two widgets on page. Then how does this one know that D3 version 3.1 is fine, this one needs 3.4, if they both load D3 and you have a conflict and all sorts of hell ensues. So that's where all this infrastructure and plumbing comes, so that when you do something, um, you can just very easily with a couple lines of code produce an interactive graphic. So think, um, you know, base R graphics to me doesn't get nearly the credit it should. That we are very spoiled by just traditional graphics in R, but also then the extension of ggplot and lats. And that you can make an image plot in one line, image volcano, and you have a very pretty attractive chart. Um, that dates back 10, 10 years or more. This is uh, another, uh, this is a widget. This is Diagrammer. Uh, it, it uses uh, Mermaid, which is a markdown type diagram. And if y'all are familiar, it's a sequence diagram. Um, so this was kind of my simple way of using Diagrammer to feed into the presentation. Um, but so our Generally, we'll do data calculations on stuff. HTML widgets will say, hey, you need these dependency findings. Then R will package it all up, send it to the browser, and then the browser interacts. Neat, right? Shiny, it goes back and forth, but that isn't nearly as uh, robust as we'd like yet. But that's a widget. So, um, just for fun, let's see what that would look like, right? So this is that slideshow that I promised I would show you. This is all we need to really tell R. Those top lines, that GML, it's just a configuration, so it's JSON. Basically saying title equals that text string, author, Birmingham R, looks better than me. 
um, date, output, reveal JS, uh, MathJax, if you like MathJax, it's very easy if by default plugs into that. Uh, I turned it off just to make this file smaller. You'll see that you know, a 7.9 megabyte file generally is not really acceptable to be pushing out of the web, especially when you're dealing with mobile and latency and all sorts. Jason might know more about that. Uh, the connections there. But what I wanted to illustrate is that file is a standalone file that if I shipped it to you by email, you'd be mad because you got a 7.9 megabyte email. But if you open up, it runs in the browser without a connection. All right? That's neat. Um, so that's more suited for the smaller. The reason is, generally, I wouldn't have all these widgets. Um, and okay, so all the, everything is contained within the HTML file? There's nothing else that needs to be shipped? No. Um, and that uses Pandoc, and it's all Base64 encoded. So with some browsers, the embedded viewer in our studio, Firefox, IE, it won't work well. Chrome works pretty well. Um, but they're working for that. But it's a base 64, so basically it just not even minimize it. It, it packages it all up in binary, all that text, and then you can ship it out. I can kind of show you what it looks like. It's just a big garbled mess. But um, that is something I wanted to illustrate and wanted to focus on. But here is the code for producing that sequence diagram. I don't know of any other program that would make it that easy. Um, and sequence diagrams, I've never seen one until I started playing with this. Um, but they're really neat in that um, you know, it sort of illustrates the participants and the communication back and forth. And then there's some conditional. Um, there's an interesting couple sets of papers. Um, but that's pretty neat to me. Um, and that's all it takes. If you notice, if I didn't have that many participants or that many lines, I could do it in one or two lines of code. Um, so that's, that's sort of the objective. Yeah. Uh, the diagrammer has two packages, I mean two functions. And most widgets right now generally only come with one or two functions, intentionally. They're made to be simple. Um, then it has a couple sample um, helper methods. Um, but Diagrammer has Mermaid, uh, which makes sequence diagrams and very basic directed graph diagrams. Um, I think it's directed acyclic? Acyclic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, graphs. Um, but there, there's some limit um, in how far you can go with them. If anybody's familiar with GraphBiz, which is the old C out of Bell Labs, um, graphing engine has all sorts of nice layouts, especially for networks and various flow charts or record layouts. Um, it also comes with that. What, what it uses is another inscripted. So graph is with all C. So my package it up from a JavaScript program called viz, v -I -Z .js, and it uses that so you can spit out. And I'll, I'll show you one if you like. Because um, graph is much more powerful um, than uh, Mermaid but they're both within a function. Um, and actually, you can access it three ways. You can do diagrammer, the spec, type equals mermaid, or type equals graph is, or you can call mermaid or gr, mermaid or gr, uppercase this spec, and it'll come out all, all the same. So back to that. Um, um, but it's still not interactive, right? Basically, at the end of the day, this is an SVG. So we could write script because it is SVG to do things. So if I click on this, or what I really want to see, and I don't think I've seen it, is make this like an axis. And it's assuming you have a very long one, you could drag it down, and the, the label will go down with it. Um, be neat, um, but still not nearly as interactive. But look at this. Um, if you want a leaflet map, this is how simple it is. And ignore the, the iframe part, because that was just part of this whole packaging thing. You can just do m equals, and that's really hard to say, I should have thought about that. Um, but the two lines of code that are important are here. I don't know if it shows up any better when I do that. Um, so all I'm doing is setting a width and a height, adding a pal. Um, which then goes out to 
various sources for mapping tiles. And then I just set the view to where we are, right? If you didn't notice, we are here. And if this works, I don't know if it'll work without a connection. If I had a connection, we could zoom out and see the world from where we are. Um, but I don't have it there. So um, it, it lets me go to that one level that it loaded, but it would work very well if I just had a lot of internet connection. Um, so you know, that to me is fairly powerful and that I can produce an interactive map in less lines of code than I can do most of my basic scatter plots. And so, um, and yeah. So you could just using the maps like the open source maps. It can, um, and then uh, Simon has Simon, Simon, mm -hmm. uh, and Mapbox all produce some public domain uh, tiles, and then you can get paid versions, or you can even use um, if anybody's used uh, the raster um, spatial stuff from SP and various R packages, the older. Um, not SVG or uh, tile. I don't know nearly enough about geospatial as I should to be talking at this level. Um, but you can take just a, a raster or ggplot, um, ggmap data and render it on Leaflet. Um, Leaflet came out of our studio. Uh, you should see. I know I'm butchering this moment, but. Um, he uh, he produced this package and came out of our studio. Yeah. So let's just say I have Leaflet as a package. Yeah. Like what does what does Leaflet produce? Like uh, unless it has the as the as the as hypermetrics with the HTML with it, what what is the output of Leaflet? Is it just a bunch of HTML? Yeah. It's HTML with the JavaScript dependencies um, and oh, CSS. Right. So you basically pipe that stuff into a provision. Yeah. Um, so I'll. Uh, I'll show you the good question. Um, or we can go through it now if we want. Uh, but Leaflet um, is a neat little mapping tool. This, because I want it to be two lines of code, is you know, still not all that cool, but you can add pop-ups. You can add polygons to highlight this area. You can do you know, aggregation of data, core plus, all of that stuff with Leaflet with two or three extra lines of code. Um, so if you at all interested in that, I would strongly recommend to go out and just look at it. Uh, actually, yeah, that's the that's the whole towel that I got before I got here. This is another one that's still, um, and all of these really are in heavy development. I mean, HTML widgets, we started on last summer in July. Uh, was publicly released right before Christmas, December 17th or 18th. So all of these packages were either being totally developed along with HTML widgets as the spec moved with it, or in the last two months. So all of these are very new. Um, this is a neat one in that if anybody likes Excel, which is a strong statement, if you do like Excel, I happen to, one of my favorite things is pivot tables. And it's just a very powerful tool and that you can very quickly aggregate things. And then often, even um, you know, people that don't know JavaScript or HTML or programming can make maps. I mean, make, um, you know, interact with data, answer their own questions. Um, so if anybody's familiar with the Titanic data set in R, this takes that table structure and we can see things like you know how many adults and child well, how many adults and children were on um, the Titanic and how many survived or even neater um, we can do all the things we would expect but even take it a step further and do things like Yes, and then just watch this yeah, that's pretty cool. table bar chart. It shows you that, but then the, the person that looked at this and says it's misleading because they're not proportional. So what I really want to know is by each class, which 
fraction of people survive, so if sum is fraction of columns, and that makes more sense. As I think we all know, the poorer you were, the lower the status, the less desirable the result. Um, very quickly answer that question. Um, and that to me is neat. Uh, it also has a tree map that I know isn't going to fit well in here, um, but uses D3 as a render for a tree map. Or we can do a heat map where we can see, you know, sort of corporate life, uh, who has the, the worst results. Neat. I mean, so let's see the code that it took. I don't know if you'll see it, but this is it. All the other code within our pivot table is if you want to pre-render columns or aggregates and then ship it to somebody rather than just leaving them all by themselves with an empty, empty table. So that, though, my next thing would be if I select these and I want to feed them R and I want to do stuff with it. It's not built out yet, but it is in the works. Um, and let me see, anybody want have questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so this thing's up against its limits, but I was just going to show you if I pull up my old R library or pivot table R pivot table got a f oh what do y'all want to do iris would that be good I think I think it'll work and my only question is a I, I intentionally avoided Iris, but it's just too hard to resist. Yeah. My computer is literally um, up against its maximum. Uh, the browsers now pick up all, I don't know if y'all have the same problem, but any open tabs use up quite a bit of space. Um, it doesn't take nearly, nearly this long without um, what I'm running, but we'll come back to that because I don't want to take too much time. Um, so that's another one that's pretty neat. I know the Biostats people um, enjoyed the, the preview I gave at the end of the last talk. I know Curtis said that he wanted to see something a little more um, like this, I think. So this is out of Carl Broman, um, University of Wisconsin. He made QTL charts, and so this is it. So here it is. Um, and the hard part here is what I did is I made it a, um, uh, it's kind of hard to see, average SQL length, uh, I don't want to do that, I want species, and you can see that, or you can do it like that and then do uh, your table bar chart so that we know Things like that. Um, so sorry I got distracted, but I did want to show you that it did work. It does work with just your standard R. Back to QTL charts. Um, this is being converted as we speak into an HTML widget. Um, it still works very well. Uh, it just doesn't handle all the context um, as nicely as widgets do. But you'll see here things happen, and this is a, another strange just conflict uh, with multiple widgets and CSS, but the label should appear. Um, but that's a lot of different little plots. I mean, each little square, right, is its own little SVG element. When you click on it, it shows the scatter of the interaction. Um, and that's correlation, so, you know, as we, as we get to a correlation closer to one, we would expect a more linear result. Um, and then some of these white ones are not uh, as, well, as closely associated. So because there was such enthusiasm, here's another one. Um, and you can see that I should have sized this better, but you can see the, uh, I think you can see that as I drag the points that are related show up. Yeah. So this is 
So he's made some things like PPL chart for specific scenarios, like if we have our own set of different data types, how do we go about constructing constructs like this? He's working on making this more general. So he's not only just doing an HTML widget, but he's got a T3 panel package, well, not package, but JavaScript library that he's working on um, that I'm sure you'll be able to plug into your other data set. But if you want to see it, I'd be happy to work on it. I just have no domain knowledge whatsoever. Yeah. So if you... Yeah, what's on the x-axis with two little plots on the bottom? I don't know. Um, yeah, let's see if I can do... No. Maybe they're like lines or something. Uh, you size at t equals one and size at t equals five. Like, like yeah. oh, and uh, this was just sample data that he randomly generated in his help file, but um, I know that he uses it for real legitimate purposes. <coughs> There's some kind of growth function going on here. <laughs> it was a random. We'll look at the code and see if we can figure it out. This one is that whole um, uh, the image volcano. That's how simple it is to produce a plot. But for those that you know don't necessarily want to see all the data, but want to do things like this, neat, right? Um, and there's some icons that don't show up, but to me, it's just you know add this little wrapper, and this works with base, ggplot, um, lattice, almost anything I've thrown at it. That as long as it has a, it'll work with dev.svg where you can output an SVG. It'll work. So even Hive plot, I don't know if you've seen Hive plot with uh, embedded PNGs, um, all that. I have more to show off if we get there. Does anybody deal with phylogenetic data? Yeah. Um, this is the new one. Um, so each week, uh, I'm making or helping to make a new HTML list. That's my year-long commitment. This was one, and, I, and you'll see a lot of them, about half have been just independent. I much prefer to collaborate. This was out of, uh, I'll look it up, but uh, they, a group out of UCLA, I think, made phylotree.js, which is D3, um, that does all the hard work. And then what you generally have to do is just wrap it and provide the communication of data and configuration to the JavaScript library. So all the, I will say that phylogenetic trees, and I think that's how you say it, right? Yeah. Um, has been the most requested. Um, and the only other versions I've seen were mildly interactive and in that you can zoom in and out, you can pan, or you can rotate. That was a really neat one out of one of the co-creators of D3, um, Jason Davies. But this one it doesn't work as well inside an iframe, which is what I had to do to fit it nicely. No, it's not going to work at all now. Well, yeah. So you can do that and then select those and then send out just that part of the tree. You can do path to root or even neater. This is my favorite. And I don't even know if it's all that useful, but it's fun to watch is you can reroute re re on those nodes. Again, this is all within a browser, and I even put in the more difficult constraint that it's within a presentation with 15 other widgets. Um, but you can do all that stuff. Uh, and then let me see if I can expand it, expand it, sort it, change it. Make it bigger, make it smaller. And then the stuff that doesn't work at, uh, within this presentation, but will work within Chrome, not Firefox, is you can tag different elements. Um, and, you can, and then it'll ship it out with those tags in Newick format too. This one does work within Shiny pretty well. Um, it'll ship it out so that you can use just that portion or that tag tree back in your research. So that to me is um, pretty compelling uh, and a neat little widget that's you know just just kind of started. So I left this as questions and then I don't know how much time I'll have. Uh, questions if anybody has some, but I'll 
Also, I uh, should call that the detour. Um, and uh, if you want to see kind of what a widget looks like, we can do that. I've got other examples of other widgets. Uh, I'll just say the list is about 20 right now of widgets, um, maybe 25, um, that we can do. Uh, so y'all tell me which direction. If you, if you plan to go through the mechanics of starting with one of the data sets, like Iris, yeah. and then constructing um, some dimensional graph and looking at the different sort of detail thing, I, just, I see the pretty examples and I see there's packages that you have exactly the same with the data, but I'm having a little difficulty in my head around yeah. sort of the, the mechanics of constructing one of these sort of by scratch. Yeah, from scratch. And what I might do instead of that is, because it's still not perfect, and I'll say this is too much in, is refer you to a library that I want to wrap that does all that, uh, which is DCS. It has cross filter underneath it so that when you click, it does map reduce type operations. Um, so say you have, you know, the only time I like the pie chart is as a, as a legend or as a selecting region uh, because it's just, it's just fun. And, um, it doesn't really tell you the information that you won't see, but I think it is very informative as a interactive mechanism. Um, but you can click on that pie slice and all the data and all the 20 different charts that you might have in that page will adjust. That will sum it, it will uh, reduce it in any form or fashion that you like. Um, but do you see that there? Yeah. Um, that's, that's purely outside of all of this. It's, uh, it's JavaScript based on uh, E3 and Crossfilter. Mm -hmm. uh, Crossfilter was developed by Mike Bostock or Jason yeah. Davies or both, who are also the creators of E3. Um, but that's that's you know sort of the holy grail for me is the uh, that widgets need to talk to each other and they don't right now very well. So unless you have a widget kind of like QTL charts that's designed to this chart talks to this chart to this chart specifically for this type of data, um, in that case you get a good result. But if I want an R pivot table to talk to QTL charts, it becomes much murkier. And that you'll get it's easy. If you know JavaScript, well, that's not the point, right? Yeah. The point is to make it so within an extra line of code that it works. So, uh, how about a so we think like the um, virus thing, and we can, I forgot what exactly what the fields on that are, but if, if I start out with a scatter plot of, you know, main versus something else, yeah. and then put that into a graph so you can now sort of really see what that species is. Yeah. Is that pretty simple? Yeah. Start? Let me, uh, the newest with. Does that seem, seem like it could make it more than people? Do any of y'all use Python? Yeah. Python yeah. had Boca from Continuum IO, who it's also different. produces Anaconda, right? Mm -hmm. um, we just ported a lot of that into our Boca. So R uh, has that capability now. I think it's better, but don't tell anybody. Um, yeah, it, we still got some things to work out. These are the resources. This is live on GitHub. I, you know, on the meetup, I'll post it again, but I'll just start copying. I have a GitHub repo that's just for our user group, where each month we'll post in code, other related materials, uh, documents. But this is the best set of our videos that I possibly have ever seen. Um, but I'll, I'll qualify it, at least the best set um, that I've seen in two years, three years. Hadley Wickham, Jenny Bryan, uh, the lady behind Philo Seek, and I had her name. Uh, Diane Cook has um, uh, some of her students produced their uh, work. Um, uh, who else? Ron Knott talked about working widgets. So all of those are nice. These are the Data Science LA videos that I mentioned. If you want a much more um, entertaining, uh, usually always does animated GIFs on all of the slides, so it always gets a much bigger laugh than my stuff does. Mm -hmm. um, mine is sort of sparse intentionally, but I still couldn't accomplish the, uh, the effect that he's able to do. It's just a fun little 10 minute video. Uh, D3, there's up to 2,300 different examples, grouped by author, by type. Um, if you want inspiration, I'm not very imaginative. So seeing something um, often will be the trigger that says, oh, that's what I want. 
right? And then I'll go in, open up the source, and see how to how to make it into a wizard. Um, then there's my blog, um, or just generally, it's, it's it announces all the widgets of the week. It announces my widget of the week, um, and shows a couple of them. So. Should we just close that out and then go to R? Does that sound good? Um, here, uh, that was neat. But, uh, the one other thing I want to show is that Epi widgets work with um, dendrograms, so or H clust. Uh, this this is the sort of standard sort of the iris of. Uh, HCLUS data, it's the state arrest stuff. So if anybody doesn't know, just a neat little thing is you can make these sort of anonymous self-running functions in R. So what you'll see is that's all the thing, but in R Studio, it's nice to be able to condense it. Um, and then you can just run that line and it runs, right? Another little thing, if you really don't want to do the function, is you can do Oh, what is it? This? I don't know. Some uh, comment structure will make it condense also without doing a function. Um, but that was the, you know, the dendrogram. And here the selection doesn't work because it's in Firefox, but it would work in Chrome. Um, and uh, my favorite, but you know, lots of other people don't like it as much. Uh, is parallel coordinates. Oh, shoot. Did I miss it? Uh, and let's try to run it again. Yeah. So, you know, this is the diamonds data set from ggplot, but you'll notice I can then separate here. So I show this to sort of illustrate what I want to happen. Is then the next thing is I want all these points to show up on a scatter plot rendered by some other widget, right? Um, and then I can see other relationships. Uh, there's an interesting bit of parallel coordinates research uh, with scatter plots and which one um, uh, presented at one of the, I think it was this last year, which one is better at showing correlations? Um, Scatter plot wins in almost all cases except for uh, negative correlations, strongly negative correlations. And you know, ones up here, ones down there, I think it's easier to detect. But, you know, this is far more fun to me than a scatter plot, um, even though it might not be as useful to the general audience. So I want to choose that if I'm playing with it. Uh, so that's one of the things. Let me pull up um, some of the examples from uh, our BOCA, if that's okay, because I think it's the most comprehensive of these libraries um, in terms of its ability to sort of take structures um, from basic R, uh, GDPot, or the others, um, and just work. Um, so pan zoom, all these other things. So uh, this is that project um, and let's say so you know again base R graphics don't get nearly enough credit and that very few uh, programming languages or anything can that quickly generate um, uh, ADE uh, 2D density smooth chart well, that's pretty neat so um, what we can do often though is take some of the the same uh, and this needs to be prettier, um, but we can take uh, that and make it into a bokeh chart. Um, so I'm not familiar with bokeh. It's essentially just quantized. Uh, it's it's the same data, and this one. Uh, let me do a better version. Actually, um, it's hard to see. Let me try to. Uh, it's the smooth scatter, but the problem with this palette that I just gave it is this should be white, um, the blue. Uh, but it's sort of a heat map, right? It's, it's that same KDE 
smooth data so you're taking a scatter a matrix of scatter points and smoothing it into this so then you can see then you have a you know it's a much nicer experience than some of the other things wheel zoom resize and then imagine here if this is linked to another one you might have a much more sort of expected result closer to that holy grail here would be our polka with scatter so I should have shown you there was one line of code that made that and then same thing but again what I want to be able to do is take select those and then pass them to another structure there is a data tables DT and other packages by our studio that has more interactivity so that if you select a leaflet I think it will plug into it will show all the points in the data table but you can short sort and export and do those things this accepts other R structures and let's say we want to do a hex band on that same chart and for those of y'all that say what the hell is this this thing we did it's a new neat little thing that was stolen from Unix and F sharp called a pipe and that what you do is this thing becomes the first argument of this function and then what happens is this function is designed to spit out this manipulator this thing the BT stays the same but then we get a BT that's now hex band that we can chart so I highly highly encourage those that haven't started playing with pipes they come from two packages most of the R studio stuff now sort of imports a small subset but MagRitter M-A-G-R-I-T-T-R or pipe capital R are two sort of competing piping I prefer pipe R but most of the other community seems to be going the opposite direction which is often the way it goes but so you'll see here you get a hover very easy to do again pan zoom still works that is automatic on a hex band but let's take that same point structure and you can see that hover is a list now that we pass cut clarity and color one thing that if you're producing on the web charts with lots of data points such as diamond I think 60,000 sort of anything over 10,000 different elements I would say to choose a library that would use canvas rather than SVG Boca happens to do that SVG has some limits canvas is just more of a raster type format that is a little harder to interact with but much quicker because generally canvas will use GPU the graphics card and SVG doesn't as well but they are working on that and now I don't know if you can see and there are too many points but let's do a closer zoom and if we can if I can find that point you'll see that what I told it cut clarity and color from that data frame were defined by hover another neat little thing that works really well with if any of you are familiar with Tessera Ryan Happen is the guy that did most of the work from our book they do a lot of big data type R packages he did most of this work so it's very well done I'm trying to show it's box plots but I don't have the example I don't think here is has anybody read the the sort of classic lattice book from the author lattice multivariate data visualization 
Um, it's, yeah, I think it's came, it sort of came out with the package. This is my project to reproduce all those graphics in Boca. Um, so various things like that. And I don't know if you noticed that, you know, generally what structure the LY underscore will then be followed by the similar base graphics. So his gets to be image um, points, um, those things. Uh, what I wanted to show is somewhere in this example or set of examples, there's um, it works really well with um, linear models. So um, I don't know if I have time to get there, but uh, quantiles also work very well. Um, oops. So that that might be your best bet first um, for now, but um, so we can't get to where widgets talk to each other cleanly and talk back to R, then I'm not that so, uh, so we're getting there. Just still experimenting with um, various structures. Uh, oh, the other thing I wanted to show, do we have a couple more seconds? I think I have the... Um, Diagrammer package. I was going to show an example of um, how to use it in shiny context. So if we, um, uh, where is that example? It's just easier to copy paste than not. Let's see. Oh, here it is. There it is, I think. Sorry, I didn't have this ready, but I just thought it's a, a neat little um, I think way to end. Right, there it is. So help mermaid. All of these, I will say, are just packages. Um, uh, all of them are on GitHub, uh, so you can see kind of their structure. I guess while I have it up, this is the structure engine. Uh, no, this is the GH pages. Wrong branch. Sorry. Um, but they all have help. Uh, they all have uh, usually examples. A lot have vignettes. Um, so we try to make them really easy. Um, let me see. Sorry. Um, GR. This. Oh, so if we wanted to use Shiny, if, does everybody know what Shiny is? Okay, Shiny is, um, it's one of these, it's, uh, it's out of our studio, it's actually, uh, it's dual license, so it's free to um, use, uh, but um, you can also get paid where you can have all of this run on their servers so you can publish um, you know, a big data set with all of the things and then um, it talks two ways. So if you'll look down here, this is says that R is basically, Shiny has opened up a server. It's established a web socket to that browser so they can talk back and forth at this point. Um, so and I don't know graph is that well, but neat, huh? Um, so what happened is it just sent that new spec back to R. R reran the graph this function, passed the, um, passed that code back to the browser, which then re-rendered. Um, so you can sort of live. Um, Code, various things, but if you uh, want my directional communication, like I said, it's free. Um, where you get paid is if you want commercial licensing support, or you want to use their servers to publish. Um, but uh, the last thing I was going to go back and just show you, kind of, and y'all can leave at any point. I tend to get excited. So don't let me hold you up on a Friday afternoon. But I was going to show you. Um, so 
All that, like I said, was produced in R. Um, so if we take that RMD, which is the extensions R markdown, we can hit knit. And what you'll see is it goes through knitter, converts the R markdown from markdown, and then employs pin dot to, um, so you'll just see it running all the code, packaging it up. Pan dot then base 64 encodes all the dependencies that it finds within that document, saves it as an HTML. At the end of the long process, you'll see that's the, let me start over. Um, I'm up against memory, but if I close that, uh, I'll blame Windows. If I close it, reopen it, it should run much more nicely. Um, I seem to be, ha I only have, I think, four gigs of memory, so I'm at the four year old machine, so it has control. Um, it works pretty cleanly in memory, so that index HTML, I can, uh, I'll show you. You don't have to do anything special with like the chunk options or anything to make your render properly? No, it's kind of, I um, know, oh, I'm just asking in general, like, I was thinking that. You know, one of them where you have to use like the as is option or something to output the, uh, one of the packages. Um, no, you don't have to do anything but that. Um, I mean, you can definitely get more sophisticated. So where it says reveal JS presentation, um, you can choose HTML output, um, or you can choose PDF. Um, uh, you can choose various uh, different input, and I was just going to try to connect, but it might not work. But if I open that in the editor, it's probably going to tell me it's maxed out. Um, let's just do this. How about let's make a new one, and let's just copy a small section of it. Uh, we just do that. Uh, and you can do new or markdown. It gives you all sorts of neat little helpers where it will define that YAML up top. It can be kind of a pain. Um, and I didn't pick a, a widget. Let's pick a widget. Let's do this one because it's easy. Um, and you'll see, uh, so that three, the three pound or whatever it is, is just um, a header, a, th a third level header. Um, that will also separate the slide. If we do that, so it should work. Yeah, so then you get your um, thing uh, that you want uh, rendered nicely and then it's, it's available. If I look at that, uh, well, let's save it as something. So it will then and then you'll notice possibly if it works that down here is, it'll spit out a HTML file. It'll show me what it looks like here, but eh, where'd it go? I know it's here somewhere. Oh, I just have my uh, directory set incorrectly. But you'll see this is what gets spit out. So traditional HTML, this is what the base64 encoded uh, stuff. You'll see some jQuery. Um, and I said it's very unpleasant. But if you go down, if you, that's the math jacks that's pulling in. So it, it'll automatically pick up uh, formulas. This is that data in a JSON object. So this is what a widget looks like. What gets passed is a, a Container generally a div. Um, so, so it's right there uh, where it says div HTML widget 9929. And then it passes a, a script um, with the JSON uh, data. Uh, and this can vary slightly, but generally the thing is data and then configuration are all the options that get passed. And then um, the code 
for that. Um, it's going to be a pain. Um, let's show you. Let's take half your widgets. So the, I should have noted that the, the tree viewer, the phylogenetic tree viewer, um, also is a whole collector. It continues to be a whole collection of data, but this is it's just a it's more of a directory structure. If you're familiar with a traditional package, it looks just like a package. Um, you have to have a description, the namespace, uh, the R code, so the R function will go in R. Um, the inst will hold all the HTML widgets um, code. So these are all the dependencies there, uh, various licenses. But if you look at the code for tree widget, there's um, here's the code for it. That's sort of the wrapping object. It's not actually the, the library. It's just the tree, and this is the YAML that's defining all the dependencies. So I mentioned that cross uh, conflicting dependencies will cause all sorts of problems. So this will choose. If we have two widgets, it will choose the most current. So if we both have jQuery or V3, it will just pull in one version. Sometimes your widget is dependent on an older version. If there's a breaking API change, it won't work. Um, but there's no way really around that because you can't have two instances cleanly. Um, but that is it. Um, I'm doing these once a week. If anybody has any ideas of something they'd like to see, I said my imagination is short. I'm eight weeks in, and I still have 44 left to go. Uh, so uh, ping me on meet, um, meet up. I operate sort of pseudo anonymously just for compliance reasons and finances, time and portfolio. So the blog there with an old finance directed time and portfolio .com. Building widgets.com is the new sort of site only for the purpose of making widgets. Um, and then on GitHub, Time and Portfolio, on Twitter, Time and Portfolio. For those that um, do get on Twitter and don't know the hashtag, RStats is sort of the official R hashtag. Other than that, I really appreciate you coming. And look forward to uh, the next meeting, which brings us to that topic. Anybody have ideas?